In the previous video, we looked at coming up with a second order model that would allow us to uh, predict some pressure transducer dynamics. In this video, I'm going to look at a Jupyter notebook that allows us to actually do some calculations. Now, before we can do those calculations, we really need to make some wild guesses based on about the size of the box for a pressure transducer on what the mass and the area and so on would be. So this outlines here getting to those numbers. <coughs> and uh, once we've got to those numbers, we'll need to be able to scale them up and down. So if we double the scale, for example, the area and the stiffness might go up as the square and the mass would go up as the cube. If we have the scale, they're going to go down as the square and the mass would go down as the cube. Damping, hard to figure out, but we can punch in some numbers and see what happens. So I'm going to start off here by defining a simple step function for pressure and simulating the instantaneous release of pressure by popping a balloon. So we'll start off with pressure for the first portion of our time equal to a thousand and then we'll drop it very suddenly down to zero. And we'll make sure that we've got a time to uh, do our calculations over. So this is a linear space in time that goes from a little bit negative through time zero and on to quite a bit more positive. And T max is the time duration that we're looking at. I make some copies of the time duration for velocity and position just so that I've got the right size uh, uh, vector array to put things into. And I define this reset props uh, uh, function down here to set the values for the area, the mass, the stiffness, and the damping coefficient. And if I wanted to change scales, I could reset the properties for half scale or double scale and see how it all happens. So the area scales as the square of the size, the mass is the cube of the size, stiffness is the square of the size, and damping I'm guessing as the square of the size. So we'll need to run this. And ideally, nothing should happen when we run it, and, and nothing happens, so that's good. Just did all the calculations in the background to get set up. Now we're going to predict the position and the velocity of the pressure diaphragm based on the assumed parameters. So I'm going to define all of this inside of a function so that I can call it again later. Uh, but for now, we're going to plot out the raw pressure input. That's our step function. We'll set the velocity equal to zero and we'll set the position in equilibrium with whatever the applied pressure is at the start. We'll figure out what our time step is because we're taking our total time dividing by the number of time steps. And then for each time step we can calculate the force. It'll be the area times the pressure pushing down, uh, minus K times Y, the spring force pushing up, minus C times V, the damping force proportional to the velocity uh, that's friction so it always acts in the direction opposite to the velocity. The acceleration will be the force divided by the mass and then we can estimate the change in velocity as the acceleration times delta t. The velocity at the new time will be equal to the velocity at the old time plus the change in velocity. We can estimate the change in position based on the velocity and delta t and the position at the new time will be equal to the position at the old time plus the change in position. <coughs> We've got a conditional here to allow us to maybe plot the velocity and position in our output and <coughs> We've got the indicated pressure, which we can calculate from the uh, y value, just according to the scale factor, the stiffness versus the area that we found in the, in the other video. So we can calculate the indicated pressure and plot that out as well. Then we'll put some labels and stuff on the axes. So if I run that one, this is the solution I get out. The blue line that comes across here and goes down here to zero, that's the raw pressure input in kilopascals. So 1,000 pascals down to zero pascals. 
The orange line is the velocity. What's going to happen to the transducer in its motion? The green line is the position. It'll start off negative and moving up. And finally, the red line is the indicated pressure. So initially it was in equilibrium and it stays in equilibrium. Then as soon as the pressure drops, it accelerates downwards. It overshoots because it's got some inertia. <coughs> Comes to a stop, goes back up, come back down, and so on. And it oscillates back and forth. So this is doing the kind of thing that we expect from a mass spring damper system, a sec typical second order response. So that's no surprise. It, it performed as we expected it to. Now, if we've taken Math 225, or we're taking it right now, or any other ordinary differential equations course, we'll know that the natural frequency depends on the stiffness and the mass in this relationship here. So we could calculate uh, the natural frequency. I'm going to reset the properties with a scale half as big and see what happens. I'll do that run over again and print out some stuff. Then I'm going to calculate the natural frequency according to this relationship, and I'll get the natural frequency. That, of course, is in radians per second. I'll get it in hertz by dividing by 2 pi. And finally, I'll get the period, how long it should be between zero crossings, by taking 1 over the natural frequency in hertz. So if I run that, let's see what I get. This time, I didn't tell it to plot the velocity and the... Uh, uh, and the position, I just wanted to plot the uh, acceleration, or sorry, the indicated pressure output. And first thing I noticed, that red graph there and this orange one, the frequency got higher. So when I made the pressure transducer half the size, I got a faster response time. When I calculated the natural frequency, I got 632 radians per second, or about 100 hertz, about 100 times a second. So the period should be about 0.01 seconds. And if we look here, coming down from there, down to there and back up again to that peak, that is about 0.01 seconds. So our natural frequency calculation is working for us. That's good. Now, I'm going to run some exponential smoothing <coughs> to see if I can smooth some of that off, because what I'd really like to know is what the pressure is. I don't want to see it oscillating like this. I'd like to see something a little smoother. So I'll try some exponential smoothing. And sure enough, the blue line here allows me to get something that, admittedly, it responds rather slowly. <coughs> But it's giving me something that looks a lot more like uh, like the actual pressure that uh, that this system's experiencing. Now, if I increase the damping, then that should slow the response of the pressure transducer down until it looks more like a first order response. So let's try that. Let's increase the damping. Damped out faster but still getting a lot of oscillation there. Well, let's double the damping again and see what happens. It's damping out even faster. Do it again. Even faster. If we keep increasing the damping, then We'll keep on getting less and less overshoot. Now we're getting just a little bit of overshoot, and that comes right in. Finally, double it again, and we see no overshoot at all. And this is starting to look like a first order response. And if we put that damping into our pressure transducer, <coughs> then we get a way faster response with a way smoother response than we get from our fairly simple exponential smoothing here. So 
we can build in this physical damping into our pressure transducer or we can go looking for some way to build better numerical damping into our processing than we get from our exponential smoothing. But most likely what we're going to do to avoid transient problems in pressure measurements is we're going to try to make sure that our changes in pressure happen at frequencies that are much slower than the natural frequency. So we'll try this out at some lower frequencies. Here I'm going to take a, a fraction value of 0.3 and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my pressure uh, to have a frequency that's some fraction of the natural frequency here. So let's try this one. <coughs> okay, now I've got a pressure oscillation that is happening at about three-tenths of the natural frequency or about uh, three and a third uh, natural frequencies per, per oscillation. That's following fairly closely. The indicated pressure, it lags a little bit, but it's not bad as long as I'm staying under the natural frequency. If I go down to a tenth of the natural frequency, then I'm down here, I'm getting a very close following result. Just a little bit of a lag here. Now those were with this damping built in. Let's go back up here and reset all of our values. So I'll reset the properties by running this one. And this is the kind of behavior I'll get. So when I go down here, without that high damping, I'll get very close following from my original pressure transducer. So unless I need to get up really close to the natural frequency or maybe even over it, and this step function contains very high frequencies, then I probably don't want to build any additional uh, damping into my physical pressure transducer. I just want to filter it off later numerically. So let's try going up again here. If we go up to 0.3, we're seeing with the low damping, very little effect here. The reinforcement is actually making it overshoot a little bit past the actual measured pressures, or sorry, past the actual raw pressures. Let's go to half the natural frequency. Now we're getting some significant overshoot. And finally, if we had it at one times the natural frequency, with no damping, we get some really wacky stuff going on. So you'll want to stay away from that natural frequency. Ideally, try to stay down around a tenth of the natural frequency, and you'll get beautiful response out of your pressure measurements, as long as you can stay under about one-tenth of the natural frequency. So we made a model mathematically. We found a second-order differential equation. We could go and solve that second-order differential equation analytically, but it's a lot easier to go in and solve it numerically. And that's what we've just done in this Python code. And it's really pretty simple here to follow that code through using an Euler approximation of just saying the new velocity is the old velocity plus the change in velocity due to the acceleration over a very short time step. And doing that kind of a calculation happens really quickly and allows us to predict what's going on uh, for different pressure and, uh, and uh, uh, position histories. So if we had a, a perfect second order system like in our model here with no nonlinear coefficients, it's still really easy to do it numerically. If we introduced any nonlinear coefficients, we wouldn't be able to do the analytical solution, and getting a numerical solution would be the only way to go.